to see the life that God has created all around us. To give thanks for the gift we have received. To notice the beauty and promise of the morning. To breathe deeply of the season of summer. To accept God's gift of love and to love in return. All of these things. Our scripture reading this morning is from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Oh 
Let's pray together. Lord, we are gathered here, opening our minds and hearts and spirits toward you. We do not gather to hear what I have to say. We gather to hear your word. And so we ask that you would speak your word to each one of us, the word that you would have us hear. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, um, just a word about sermon titles. Um, I set my sermon titles three, four, six weeks in advance, and by the time I get around to actually preaching the sermon that I entitled that long ago, it often has nothing to do with the title. So, if, if you can draw a connection between today's sermon title and what I'm actually going to say, you're a better theologian than I am, and I want you to talk to me after the service. In the late uh, 1920s, Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company faced a real problem. Almost 60 years before that, so in the early, like, 1870s, a number of entrepreneurs had taken rubber tree seeds out of the Amazon basin and planted them in East Asia. In the tropical soil and the climate there, the trees took off, and over time, those seeds became huge plantations, which came to dominate the world's rubber market. As the automotive industry grew, of course, so did the demand for rubber tires. The problem was that by this time, the global rubber market was controlled by this small group of growers in Asia, so prices for rubber went through the roof. Obviously, this was a problem for Ford in its quest to build affordable cars. Now, I guess no one could accuse Henry Ford of thinking small. His solution to this problem was to create a kind of industrial rubber tree farm and manufacturing plant in Brazil, specifically to grow rubber trees and harvest the sap and make rubber. Ford dreamt of a kind of a manufacturing utopia that he would create, and he modestly called the city Fordlandia. <laughs> this is true. Ford hired workers from the U.S. to find a site in the Brazilian jungle to level all the trees and build the town. He shipped in all the materials and all the tools and all the workers to create a town for 10,000 Brazilian workers, complete with a water tower, paved streets, modern American homes with white picket fences, a cafeteria for everyone who worked there, buildings and equipment for processing the rubber tree sap, and all the accommodations that he thought workers and their families could need. Everything, including the water tower, was made in the U.S. and shipped in to Brazil. Now, as Brazilian workers were hired, they had to sign strict contracts to uphold Ford's idealistic vision of life in Fordlandia. They were required to dress like American workers instead of wearing their own Brazilian clothes. Rather than working a typical Brazilian schedule where they beat the oppressive heat and humidity by starting work before dawn and finishing about noon, rather than that, Fordlandia's labor force was required to work 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., American hours, Monday through Friday. Clocks in the town were set to Detroit time, which, of course, didn't exactly mesh well with local schedules. The factory cafeteria served only American food shipped in from the U.S. People could order hamburgers on white bread buns. They could get canned peaches and oatmeal and stuff like that, but they could not get local Brazilian food. At Henry Ford's direction, Fordlandia was an entirely dry town. Anyone caught drinking alcohol in any form was subject to immediate dismissal. Now, as you might guess, there were certain problems from the start. For, for one thing, Ford hired engineers to design and run the plantation. They were probably good engineers, but they didn't have a clue about agriculture. So they planted rubber trees close together to make the best and most efficient use of the land. That meant that the trees were susceptible to disease and parasites. The modern American homes, with their picket fences on their paved streets, were built right on the ground instead of elevated, like Brazilian houses were, and that meant they were open to every kind of insect and lizard and snake that just sort of wandered by. From the start, 
The trees produced very little rubber, and as disease and parasites set in, things got worse. The farm and the factory workers also started to get sick, partly because they were being forced to work in the hottest and most humid parts of the day. Because the venture was not working well, and because it was very expensive to create, Ford began to pay the workers less than they had originally been promised. The company also increased prices for things like work clothing and food. By late 1930, the workers had had enough of this. A riot started in the cafeteria one day and quickly spread through the town. Apart from trashing the cafeteria, which they hated, the workers didn't actually do much damage to the buildings, but the executives and supervisors realized that they might be in trouble, so they got into a boat and they went down the river to escape the anger of the workers. They stayed away for a few days until Brazilian army troops arrived to put the riot down, but by the time the army got there, the rioting was over anyway. After a few days, the company made some basic concessions to the workers and work started up again. The next year, in 1931, a Brazilian, or a Brazilian, I'm sorry, a British journalist visited Fordlandia. In the article that he published about it afterward, he wrote, in the long history of tropical agriculture, never has such a vast scheme been entered in such a lavish manner and with so little to show for the money. Mr. Ford's scheme is doomed to failure. And so it was. The journalist was not wrong. At the peak of production, Ford's rubber operations produced 750 tons of rubber in one year. The problem was that Ford needed 38,000 tons of rubber every year. Eventually, synthetic rubber was invented, and Fordlandia was just abandoned, a ghost town in the jungle. Today, it's still very remote, and today it's occupied by about 3,000 people, mostly squatters who just decided, well, nobody else is living here, so we might as well. Now, there are a lot of things that we could say about the failed experiment of Fordlandia. We could call it an example of well-intentioned arrogance or not-so-well-intentioned cultural imperialism. We could say the creators of that, of that experiment were so convinced of their own superior knowledge, despite all the evidence, that they were blinded. But whatever else we might say about Fordlandia, whatever else it might be, it does seem to me that Fordlandia is a classic example of what happens when we prioritize rules over relationship. I know hindsight is 2020 and Monday morning quarterbacking is easy, but I wonder how things might have been different if Ford's managers and engineers had taken the time to build relationships with the local people, had taken the time to get to know them, to include them in decision making, to take their suggestions about agriculture and building, to ask for their wisdom, to find out if what they imagined was even possible. Today is the third week in our sermon series that I'm calling Unsettled Times. I'm focusing in this series on the biblical authors who are often called the 8th century prophets. These are people who lived 750 to 800 years before the birth of Jesus, who felt called to speak God's word to the kings and the rulers of their day, to call the people back to faithfulness in unsettled times. I think their words, first spoken 2,800 years ago, have a lot to say to us today about how to deal with our own unsettled times. All four of these 8th century prophets, interestingly, all four of them point to the danger posed by the Assyrian Empire, which was looming on their border, gathering its forces ready to attack. And all four of them talk about the conditions that make Israel vulnerable to being conquered. I keep saying it's four prophets. It's Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. Now, I'm not saying that we're about to be militarily conquered the way that Israel was, but these prophets still have a lot to say to us, I think, because what they tell the people of their time has little or nothing to do with military preparedness or superior firepower or even border protection. Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, they all tell us that the community God calls Israel to form has already been defeated from within. Israel has fallen prey to division and corruption and greed. They failed to care for the poorest and most vulnerable among them. They've turned their backs on God. People in the kingdom simply no longer believe in the ideals that are supposed to be its foundation. They no longer believe that they are one 
people. Hosea, who we heard from last week, says that even the priests have violated their covenant with God. Even the priests. The priests should be reminding ancient Israel of their sacred duty to care for each other, to build community. But instead, they're doing the same thing that the rulers are doing. They're enriching themselves at the expense of the weak and the poor. They, too, have forgotten who God is, and so they've forgotten who they are. It's no wonder, say the prophets, it's no wonder they weren't strong enough to resist the Assyrians. It's no wonder they were conquered. Now this morning, Pat read for us from the prophet Micah. In other parts of the book that bears his name, Micah sounds a lot like Hosea and Amos. Micah writes, Alas for those who devise evil deeds. When morning comes, they perform them just because it is in their power. They covet fields and seize them, houses, and take them away. They oppress householder and house. Later, he says, the faithful have all disappeared from the land, and there is no one left who walks upright. They all lie in wait for blood. The official and the judge ask for bribes. The powerful dictate whatever they desire, and thus they corrupt and pervert justice. If we look at these four prophets together, if we read them alongside each other, we can get a pretty clear picture of what's going on in their society. There is a deep, deep disconnect between powerful rulers and everyday people. Society is fragmented. Compassion is scarce, almost non-existent. People are scared. Corruption and dishonesty are everywhere. Even the priests have turned their backs on the basic elements of their covenant with God and taken advantage of vulnerable people. It all seems maybe a little too close to headlines that we might read today. As far as Micah is concerned, Israel is defeated by its own behavior before the Assyrian army even crosses the border. But there is something different about Micah's situation and therefore about his writing. See, the other prophets we've heard from, Amos and Hosea, they saw Assyria overrun Israel. They saw the horrible consequences of the behavior that they had been trying to warn people about. Micah saw all of that too. But he lived on for nearly 40 years after that. And the last few chapters of his book are written from that later perspective. The people didn't hear what he had been telling them until it was too late. But now, after the fact, now they want to know how they can rebuild their relationship with God. With what shall I come before the Lord, they ask. With what shall I bow myself before God on high? Burnt offerings? Calves, a year old, rams, rivers of oil? Do we have to dedicate our firstborn? What, what does God want? How do we convince God we are serious? What are the rules? And Micah says, how about treating each other well? How about being kind? How about humility? Maybe, maybe those things are all God wants. Maybe those things are all God has ever wanted. A society in which people are kind and decent, and care for one another. See, I love this passage because in the beginning of it, the people are asking Micah for a set of rules. They want to know the proper sacrifices, the correct ritual, so that they might atone for their sins, so that they might satisfy God. The prophet points them instead to something much, much simpler and much more difficult. If you want to please God, he says, Build good relationships with each other. Now, this was written to people of ancient Israel almost 3,000 years ago. It could have been written to us last week. Last week in my sermon, I, I quoted the Franciscan monk Richard Rohr. And I don't usually do this, but I am going to offer you another of Rohr's thoughts this morning. In one of his books, Rohr asks, Would you rather have a friend who's always right or a friend who is in right relationship with you? Of course, he says, we'd, we'd rather have the second. Rohr says, many of us grew up thinking that what God wanted was for us to be right, to be correct, even to be perfect. But what God wants is people who are in right relationship, which means that we're open, 
that we can listen to others with understanding and compassion. It means that we can admit when we are wrong, which is almost every day for most of us. It certainly is for me. Rohr continues, we keep condemning ourselves and condemning each other for not being correct, for not being perfect. Everybody seems to be trying to prove that they are right. And we have this almost collective incapacity to ever admit that we're wrong, which makes us liars most of the time. Rohr says, maybe none of us can be or need to be correct all the time, but we can always be connected. Rohr is talking here about a passage from John's Gospel, but he could have been talking about Micah. In Micah's telling, God doesn't ask us to fulfill a set of rules, to do everything right, to check all the boxes. God asks us to be in right relationship with each other. That's much harder. That's much harder than a set of rules prescribed to put some people in power over others that make some people right and make others wrong. Being in right relationship with each other, being truly open to one another, that means that we risk being changed in the interaction. It, we, it means that we might come to understand the world differently than we do now because we take the experience of others lovingly and seriously. This is no quick fix. It is not, it is not easy. It's not simple. It's not fast. It is sustained disciplined, prayerful work. But if Mike is right about this, our relationships to each other may be what saves us. Our relationships to each other directly reflect our relationship to God. And building those relationships may be the only way to create a truly solid foundation for our future. Let me invite you to take a few moments of silence. Let's pray together. God of all creation, you loved us into existence, and throughout time you have sought loving relationship with us. Wake us up to your call. Wake us up to your voice. Give us the courage and the vision to risk relationship with you and with one another, even when it is hard. Help us to be healers of your world, taking joy in one another, drawing out the best in each other, as we seek the peace and the dynamic power that flows from your spirit. You have heard the prayers that we speak aloud this morning, and you hear those that we lift silently in our hearts before you. Especially this morning, we ask your blessings for those we've named here, for Jackie Cordova in the hospital, recovering from his heart attack. We ask that you would be with the Janch's brother-in-law, Mike, as he deals with diabetes and dialysis, that you would come alongside the people of Kentucky and Arkansas, that they might truly know the presence of your spirit with them in their woundedness as they seek to recover after this terrible, terrible flooding. And we ask that you would be with the people of Ukraine, grant them your courage and your perseverance. And anywhere in the globe that there is war, we ask that you would bring your peace. We ask that you would bring your wisdom to the leaders who have the power to stop these terrible conflicts. We offer these prayers all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gathered us together, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you. You know, this past week, the uh, Gallup organization released the results of an annual survey that they've done since like 1972 or three to measure people's trust in our society's institutions. You, you probably won't be surprised to know that all institutions except small businesses and the military are less trusted than they were in the past, and churches have taken some of the biggest hits. Culturally, churches face an uphill battle right now. We're not trusted. And any time a news story breaks about some new scandal of abuse or financial misconduct, people think that's all of us, right? But even with all that, I am just crazy enough to believe that what we do here matters. I still think we have something to offer the world around us. I think we have something the world needs, even though they may not know it. In keeping with my sermon, it's not correct doctrine about God, or the sense that we're right and everybody else is wrong. That's not what we have to offer. If you know you Park, you know that's not how we think anyway. It's not how we do things here. What we do have to offer, I think, is our ongoing attempt at just and kind and humble relationship, a face-to-face -face community where we celebrate each other's joys and shoulder each other's burdens, where we learn to love and care for the world as God loves and cares for all creation, where we serve because we are followers of the servant God who we meet as we direct our individual lives toward a greater purpose. Now I know, maybe for us that sounds impossibly grandiose, but every day I can tell you that I see it here. I see us in small ways moving toward that ideal. If you think this work is important, you can be involved. You can support it in all kinds of ways. Being here in worship is one of the ways that you do. Additionally, we need your prayer. We need your presence in the community whenever you can be here. We need your expertise and your service. And if you want to support the church financially, you can give by dropping a cash or check in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary, or you can give online at uparkdenver.com by clicking on the giving link at the top of the page and following the prompts that you'll see there. But I want to thank you this morning for all the ways that together you make us a better church. Let me invite you to stand as we're able and to join in singing our final hymn. This week and every week, may God bless you with the challenge of opening your life to others. As hard as it can be, may we all serve God by truly coming to know the people around us as the people of God. And may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds and your spirits in the love and the knowledge of God from this time on and forever. Amen.